Hey, good humans. This episode is brought to you by TikTok. Before we jump into the episode, we actually want to hear from one of our favorite TikTok creators and a big Jubilee fan. This is Zara. Hi, I'm Zara. I'm an Afghan American and a child of immigrants. My parents moved to the United States about 26 years ago with hopes of a better life and more opportunities for my siblings and I. Opportunities that they never had growing up in Kandahar, Afghanistan during a time of turmoil. Um, throughout their childhoods, my parents faced countless obstacles and struggles. Obstacles and struggles that shaped them into the people that they are today. Resilient and hardworking, courageous and selfless. And throughout my own childhood, I never had to struggle in that same way at all. But my parents taught me those same traits that they grew up with to be hardworking and strong-willed and resilient. And I'm grateful that I have a platform like TikTok to share that on. Thanks, Sarah. Make sure you check her out and other amazing TikTok creators by downloading the app TikTok. And for now, enjoy this episode. It is not so much me accepting America and becoming an American. It's more about America accepting me. I am an immigrant and I am a parent. Born in India, three kids. All born in America? Yes. Mm -hmm. I am from Brazil. My firstborn was um, seven months when we came in. I am first generation Nigerian Cameroonian American. I would describe myself as a daughter of immigrants. I love that I know exactly where my roots are. I don't really hear a lot about child of immigrants experiences and I really want to hear from the other side as well, from my parents' side. I think I want to see just the love and compassion of each culture. Hey guys, I'm Kendra, I'm 27 years old, and I'm the casting producer at Jubilee, uh, and I'm first generation Nigerian Cameroonian American. My name is Marco Landon. Um, I'm a student at UCSD, I'm 20 years old, and I'm a child of immigrants, um, and I identify as Asian American. I am Fanny, I am 41, and I'm a filmmaker, and I grew up in Venezuela. My name is Christine, I'm 28 years old, and I'm first generation Chinese American. Hi, I'm uh, Romy Singh, I'm 57 years old, I was born in India, and I am an immigrant father of three children born in America. My name is Soraya, I'm 54 years old, I was born in Brazil, and I'm mother of four. And I have my immigrant parents on the left, and my first-generation Americans on the right. If you agree, come to the middle. I feel like I have a better life than my parents did. My parents had a good life because especially my dad, they had, you know, he had a big family with siblings, but, you know, uh, he graduated high school really late because he had no shoes and he had no support. And my mom too, she lived in a, in a room with her siblings and my grandma and they worked so hard and then they brought us to this country and I'm very, very grateful. Um, my parents grew up in Cultural Revolution China, so they always tell me that you know, they didn't have the opportunity to go to school and that's why they came here, so that my brother and I could and have the opportunity that they did not have. And birthday parties, too. Like, my mom doesn't actually know when her birthday is because they don't like, keep track of that in Cameroon, so we like, joke that it's like December 31st, maybe. But um, like, I, had, I had birthday parties growing up, and like, my father fought in a war when he was 11. When I was 11, I was watching Nickelodeon. Like, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't have the same experiences as my parents growing up. I'm very appreciative because I was able to go to school. My mom did, wasn't able to go to school. Um, they have to leave their home country. Where's the home country? Where's your home country? Palestine. Palestine, okay. Yeah. I guess on top of everybody, what everybody's saying, aside from the money aspect, I feel like I was able to be more expressive here. I'm like openly queer. I also talk about my mental um, illnesses pretty openly, and I feel like that's something my that parents were never able to talk about. Like I know my father and my mother both suffered from abuse as well. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the things that they've gone through, they feel like I feel like they had to internalize and not really been able to really express or find proper treatment or care for these um, certain things. I don't think my parents had to go through a few things as I had to go through with my kids. My parents had to deal with 
things that are not showing up home at 8 o'clock for dinner, and I have to worry about making sure the kids don't get into drugs or into some other bad habits. Looking back, what it would have been or could have been had I been back in India, I think those are big things that I would say are differences. I feel out of touch. So when I was like 11 or 12, my dad tried to take my sister and I to Igbo classes. That's the language that they speak uh, in his tribe in Nigeria. And nothing, made no sense, in one ear and out the other. I think also too, a lot of like the cultural norms of like Nigerian Cameroon, I don't agree with. For example, <laughs> uh, hitting your kids is acceptable. And I, and I don't agree with that and I do not, like that, that how, that's how I was raised. My father passed away, I was six. So but my mom and my brothers really kept the culture and thanks to them that I was able to learn the Arabic language, but I never been back home. I truly feel like I'm missing out on it. Yeah. Um, I think for me, it's that I don't feel necessarily Asian enough, nor do I feel necessarily American enough. I know that a lot of my Asian friends would say I'm very whitewashed, and when I speak Cantonese or Chinese, it's like, oh, why do you say it like that? Oh, you don't know how to say that. Um, and then when I have non-Asian friends, they would say, oh, like, you're very Asian. Like, <laughs> what, like you use chopsticks? Or, oh, you only want to get Asian food all the time. So then there's always, like, these other people always chiming in about me and my cultural identity that I never really get a chance to really define myself in that. Uh, maybe I misunderstood the question because I definitely identify with, you know, not feeling American enough or not feeling Asian enough, but I feel like when I think cultural roots, I think like family values that my parents instilled in me, you know, being kind and you know, being generous and taking care of family and like those kind of principles. My father, the grandfather for the kids, he lives with us. My mother passed away and then he came to live with us. So that's the other connectivity we have to the culture and you know, we do things, simple things like you know, my kids, when they're home, they have tea with my dad every evening at five o'clock. And so, and that's when they talk. And uh, I think that's the other connection we have because we are a multi-generational so household. Too. For me, because my parents are in the States too. So they really, you know, my dad makes that epas and, you know, we have a WhatsApp group with my family and I check it every morning and they keep me updated to what's happening. And I try hard to, instill that in my kids, it's hard. Do you feel like the only way to keep that is through like generational ties? Because I didn't grow up with grandparents. All of my grandparents died by the time I was seven, so I didn't know um, anyone in my past family and my parents' siblings, like most of them have passed away as well. Certainly a way to stay connected, but for example, there's a group of Venezuelans in LA that we meet and we keep in touch Every city I go to, I make it a point to find the one Venezuelan restaurant. Like, I mean, you can definitely dig and it takes work, but I think it's important. Having the privilege to grow up in America, um, being around people of different cultures and backgrounds and just diversity, I feel like I wouldn't be the person I am today if I wasn't able to meet the people I met or even just talk to the people I've ever talked to. I spoke English in my home. I didn't grow up in a family that spoke the same language at all. My dad speaks Igbo, my mom speaks a combination of like pidgin English and French, and I only know English. My parents, I always make this joke, like we taught you English whenever I try to correct them when they say something. <laughs> and they're like, well, we're the ones who taught you English. So um, that's the only language that we can all connect through. I think also um, my parents wanted me to assimilate into the U.S. as much as possible. So everything they said and everything that they ever read and was in English, and even the TV shows. Like every time I would kind of maybe put on like an HK TV, like Hong Kong TV or something, like oh no, no try Nickelodeon or try Cartoon Network, mainly because they didn't want me to feel ostracized because they knew like back in like first or second grade, a lot of kids would mock me when I would like speak Chinese. My mom speaks English and my dad does not, so a lot of times I'll communicate in both and. My friends will hear me on the phone and I'll go from Chinese to English and they're like, you're speaking Chinglish. I'm like, I am. Like, my parents understand both and sometimes I'm disappointed in myself if I can't find the Chinese word because I feel like I'm losing my Chinese. 
you know, I speak with my family in Spanish. My brother tries to talk to me in English sometimes. <laughs> And it's weird, it just feels weird. <laughs> it's like, hey, why are you talking to me in English? You know, uh, but then with my kids, it's been so difficult to teach them Spanish. And they went to dual immersion school and you know, when they were little, I was like, you're gonna learn Spanish because I want you to be bilingual, but it's very, very difficult. And I think now they're a little older, they're, they're trying to learn Spanish. Yes, I, I love talking to my sister who also speaks three languages, and depending if we want to exchange some secret, in front, even in front of our kids, we usually, you know, speak in whatever language the others don't understand. But <laughs> also helps. <laughs> yeah, it also helps being connected back to where you come from. Yeah. yeah. Do you find yourself uh, changing when you're speaking? Um, I, I like, can do this very easily. Yeah, yeah. Without knowing. Well, there's certain things you can say in English easier than in Spanish, and vice versa. Like the word for love in Spanish, we have like ten words for love, you know, and English is love, you know, so <laughs> there's certain things that are easier in a certain language. But is it bad that I don't really want to speak my mother tongue that much? Um, it's mainly because like I, it's tethered to like really negative emotions. Um, my father was abusive towards me, so a lot of the yelling and a lot of the conflict and then a lot of the screaming was all done in Chinese. So whenever I hear Chinese now, I associate that immediately with wow. that violent household. So that's why like even when my friends, they love to speak Cantonese to me, it's like, that's awesome, yay. But I don't really want to speak it back because it's associated with such anger. But there's a billion people in China. Right, there I get, is. I'm not denying what you went through. Right. But I think you'd be missing an opportunity. But it's a little different. So yeah. both Mark and I speak Cantonese, which is largely, I would say, a dying language because only people from Hong Kong or the small southern part of China speak Cantonese. The majority of China speaks Mandarin. I love being able to speak Chinese with my parents because sometimes there's things that are more easily expressed right. and my parents always try to teach me the way, like different ways of life and different principles that can only be said in Chinese because if they're said in English, you're like, I'm, so, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me? So like, I like You think being... differently, right? Yeah. Like sometimes I'm different, like, so I think that's the opportunity, really, to really look at the world a little different. Yeah. It's more expansive. What's the best part of being an immigrant parent? I think the best thing is that I can really bring knowledge to them, They're, that things aren't done the same way everywhere, because uh, I grew up differently. I was born in the States, but I left when I was a baby and I grew up in Venezuela. So it's very interesting to see how my kids are growing and how I grew up and I feel sometimes they're missing out on certain things, but I also see all the opportunities they're getting that I didn't. I am able to talk to my parents about mental health. Really? Oh my gosh. I mean, my parents are pretty open people. Uh, we talk about anything. My mom went through depression, um, and we were there for her. At first, we thought she was making it up, so that might have been like culture. <laughs> but you know, uh, with time, we started to learn about it. And there's a great um, there's a great system here for mental health. So I think um, I learned a lot. And but like I said, my parents and I talk about everything. Uh, we're very open with each other. <laughs> so, um, I think mental health in a lot of Chinese American households is ignored, mainly because, you know, my parents never had the outlet to share how they felt to speak up because they always had larger things going on in their life, like trying to survive in cultural revolution China. How I interpreted it is if I was feeling depressed or some type of way, I could tell my parents. Now, would they do anything about it? No. Because in Africa, what I noticed, you know, this is from like, I, watched, I grew up like watching a lot of Nigerian movies. When someone has mental health problems, they call it like, oh, they just have an evil spirit in them. They need to get the evil spirit out, you know? I'm not saying that people there do not have it, but it's not talked about. There's a pride there. Um, and I know this because I'm pretty sure my dad has had depression since I was born. And like me and my siblings recognize it now, but like he would never. The thought of saying, hey, dad, do you, do you wanna go to therapy? Maybe you should see a therapist. 
completely off the table. Why would I go see a therapist? I'm fine. If you have a roof over your head, you have clothes on your back, you're fine, I'm fine. I mean, it's a whole saving face culture as well in Chinese culture. Like, you can't let someone see that you're weak. Yeah. Like, any emotion is weakness. So no matter what it is, just be strong. And if you can't be strong, pretend like you're strong and just get over it. You're absolutely right, Kendra. You know, it's like if somebody is emotionally disturbed, they would say they're, you know, they have a bad spirit or there would be a common term given that he's a crazy, right? Mm -hmm. But it's only about a few decades since now we actually are giving labels to specific diseases associated with the mind. So for me, I never had a chance or never had the need to discuss this. I feel like that's a question I'm gonna to have to answer like in a few years. I feel like when I'm at a place where I wanna be, then I can say yes, but reflecting on where I am in my life right now, I don't, I don't know if I'd necessarily say it made me better because I still feel like, I still feel like there's a lot of a pattern of how they were raised and then their parents were raised and their parents were raised with how they raised me. And it's a lot of like struggles and difficulties I'm trying to deal with now as an adult living in America, as opposed to Nigeria or Cameroon. I see myself as American. I've been here since 86. I came in, yes, not speaking English, and I learned with my children everything else. That's why I feel like I'm more American now than I am Brazilian or than I am Arabic. I was naturalized. I raised my hand. But raising the hand uh, and when you swear allegiance, it's not enough. Uh, I think you have to really feel it here. And, you know, I've been here since 85, one year more than you. Yeah. And uh, for me, it is not so much me accepting America and becoming an American. It's more about America accepting me and making me part of this country. And uh, I just feel I lived most of my life here. You know, my kids were born here. Uh, everything has been good to me. So I feel very much as an American here. Um, although I was born here, like, distinctly like American, I feel like I identify more with Asian American. Um, but even then, that term is very murky, since being Asian isn't enough for my Asian friends, and being American isn't enough for my, I guess, American friends. I, when I was 17, I moved to this country, and I was taking my college entrance exam, and there was, I was supposed to check a box to say what ethnicity I was or what nationality, and there, was not a nation, there wasn't a box for Venezuelan, obviously, and that was the first time ever I was confronted with selecting my ethnicity. So even though I've lived in this country longer than I lived in Venezuela, I am constantly being told where are you from? Where is that accent? Even though my accent is extremely mild. And so just like you said, I do feel like I'm American because I'm from South America and North America, so I feel double American. But the fact that I am constantly being asked where I'm from and that I don't have a say because I'm not from this country, even though like my, my kids are from here, I live here, I pay taxes. I don't know how anybody I just have to be blind, like any one of you feel American. Not in this time, not in this country, because it's a constant thing. But, but, but it's not always malign, you know? Some people are generally just curious, and I used to think very negatively, like, oh, do you speak Chinese? Like, where in Asia are you from? Like, and I take it as an opportunity to educate them. Like, I'm Asian American, my parents are from China, but I was born here, and, you know, I do speak Chinese. But, you know, I was born here, I'm American. It's, I take it more as a question of curiosity and, and, and rather than a, a question of, uh, of, of trying to put you down. I want to ask a follow-up. Raise your hand if you feel safe living in America. So, I... my father is a Sikh. And when 9-11 happened, he felt very scared for his life. So, I am not a Sikh, I don't wear a turban, my father does. You know, if, I, if you ask me personally, I feel safe. Sometimes I don't know if my family is safe. 
if something bad was to happen because my father wears a turban, because he's a Sikh, I don't know. I don't know if that will spill over into my household. Yeah, my children, you know, have two boys. So I, they're Latinos, you know, I do have those concerns. But that being said, I can speak here, I can be in this video. You know, in Venezuela, I'd be put in jail. I, I think it's not just the, the color of our skin or uh, the way we speak, but we get judged a lot also by our names because that, that was really hard for my children growing up in school. I, I had experience a lot too um, from my name, um, my color scan, the way I look. And, and it's just, it's how we gonna take that and deal with. We can make it worse than it, than it is or we can make it better. Your parents, are they from Brazil? No, my parents are Palestinian. They're from the Middle East. Oh, so do you have a Palestinian culture and a Brazilian culture and American culture? Yes. What's that like? I think it's beautiful. There is the good of each culture, and there's some challenging of each one of them, too. For my girls, there are certain things that they couldn't do. So that was a challenging for me, being a mom. I have or will raise my children the same way my parents raised me. <laughs> yeah, they did a good job. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> There's a lot of things that my parents did. You know, uh, we traveled a lot because they wanted to really encourage learning. Um, they actually went to university in the U.S., so I think when they went back home and they raised us, they had a little bit of the influence from the U.S., but I do love, like, you know, 9 p.m. was bedtime. <laughs> I did that with my kids or uh, family, even religion, culture, we have the same values. So, um, yeah, I do try to raise them very similar. Yeah, same here. Um, I, I, I think I am who I am because of my parents. I, I know they did the best they could, and, you know, there are things that we do things differently. I mean, we live in a different world right now. I mean, there were times that the biggest occasion for us in a month would be when we go and watch a movie together as a family. Now it's, we're standing and talking back there, we can be watching something on YouTube, right? Yeah. So it's a completely different environment, how you raise your children. Again, you have to adapt to the new environment, yeah. but the values, the culture, uh, what it takes to be a good human being, I think that baseline remains the same. <laughs> yeah, that's a hard no for me. Um, and it's because I was raised to fear my parents. A big part of it, too, is just a lot of what Americans would consider abuse. I never want to, you know, discredit, like, anything that my parents have done, because I understand that this is the best that they could do, and they did try to raise me the best that they could. But even then, I felt like there was a lot of holes that didn't need to happen. Um, my brother and I never was without growing up and they paid for our college and they did everything that they were supposed to. What I wish my parents did that if I have kids I would do four is, you know, tell them I'm proud of them. Uh, sorry guys. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm proud of them all the time even though we're not close and sometimes I feel like we just need to hear it back. Like that they're proud that we went to college and are good functioning adults in this world. I was raised by my mom and my brothers. I had three brothers, and they are all very restrict. Even getting up and looking through the window, for my mom, that was a no-no. I could not even do that. Or go to the store by myself. Oh, no, someone is going to kidnap you. So, yeah, I was a stay-home mom, so I, I took, drove my children back and forth to school and to their activities. Um, so I feel like it was different the way they were raised than I was. I was raised with more restriction, even though I was raised in Brazil. Uh, but my mom was like, she has a lot of wisdom. When I look back now to the way she was so restrict, she did the right thing. I hope that people that watch this video 
if they can relate, that they speak up. I hope it sparks a conversation that they themselves can find a mutual understanding between their parents or their kids. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed that episode just as much as I did. Feel free to follow me on TikTok at Muslim Thick and have a great day. Thank you, Zara. Uh, if you want to check her out, make sure you download TikTok and follow all of her content. She's amazing. And maybe one day you'll see Jubilee on TikTok as well. Uh, let us know what you thought about the episode in the comments below. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and we will see you next time.